in this lecture we will overview the device fabrication techniques so we learned in one of the previous class that quantum transport and especially quantum ballistic transport happens in this length scales or in this dimensional scales where the length or dimension of the device is less than the scattering length or the the phase relaxation length and um, for one of the most popular two dimensional systems which is based on gallium arsenide this elastic mean free path length le is few micrometer tens of few maybe couple of tens of micrometers and the phase coherence length is something like close to a micrometer and for silicon this elastic mean free path is only a fraction of what you can get in gallium arsenide as per the current state of art whereas the phase coherence length is close to what you have in gallium arsenide so what that means is the length scales need to reach this dimension or even lower to observe the quantum ballistic transport in devices based on these materials okay and here is a picture of the first transistor which is like close to like a centimeter and what we have here is the latest finfet which is something like seven nanometer of the pitch or the, the or, or the least dimension which is well defined which is defined in that device scale of the gate dimension okay so now this revolution of taking the device dimension from like a centimeter to seven nanometer scale has happened over many years with a lot of complicated and sophisticated technology and these are highly expensive and very complicated technology which runs on the industrial scale multi-billion industry but as far as laboratory research is concerned we don't have access to many of this technology and this in this lecture what we will do is we will overview what is generally available in research laboratory based on universities and institutes for fabrication of um, devices where you can observe quantum transport features quantum transport phenomena okay so we will not dwell into the details of the industrial scale manufacturing that is not our aim here but we will discuss what is generally available in universities and research labs for fabricating nanoscale or microscale devices now let us um, take a quick look at the length scales that we are aiming okay so as we have discussed the length scales are where we need to see single particle spacing or single particle phenomena are like few hundreds of nanometer you can also observe this in higher diamond lower dimensions but that require a lot more sophisticated fabrication technologies so what is generally available is like few tens of nanometers 
to few hundreds of nanometer to like a micrometer, which will operate in the cryogenic temperature regime, like below 4 Kelvin or below 1 Kelvin. And that is the physics and that is the technology that we are going to discuss throughout this lecture. Okay. So what we are aiming here is something like a micrometer or below in dimension. Okay, that is our aim. Something like a micrometer or below in dimension. That's what we are interested in. Okay. That is what is required to observe single particle spacing or single particle phenomena, the quantum or, or quantization due to confinement at temperature ranges below 1 Kelvin. Okay. And there is also another um, aspect that is the single electron charging phenomena. And these are the length scales and these are the temperature scale which is required to observe this. So here also around helium, liquid helium temperature you need to go beyond below few micrometer of the, of the order of micrometer to observe the single electron charging phenomena. But remember this single electron charging phenomena is not strictly a quantum mechanical effect. It's a classical electrostatic charging effect which we will discuss when we discuss quantum dots and uh, tunnel junction in one of the upcoming modules. So in nutshell, what we are seeing is we need devices with submicrometer dimensions to observe most of this phenomena. And that is the main topic that we are going to discuss in this lecture. Okay. Now the length scales or the dimensional scale are in like a few micrometer to like a few nanometer range and this regime is actually called mesoscopic regime. Microscopic regime consists of atoms, molecules and clusters like a nanometer or below and the macroscopic regime in this case is like your macroscopic objects that you see okay for a tennis ball or a period a full stop okay and if you go further down you have the blood cells then bacteria then virus so we are actually in this length scale where the device are few tens of nanometers in size okay now this dimension is called mesoscopic uh, regime or mesoscopic mesoscopic the device is called mesoscopic devices okay and just for comparison the human hair is approximately 50 to 60 micrometer in diameter okay and to reach this dimension either you can start from the microscopic and to reach the mesoscopic regime where you can basically assemble atoms, molecules, clusters, okay, and reach this regime. Or you can start from the macroscopic regime where you start with the bigger material and chop it down with the various technology and reach this regime. Okay, those are the two methods. This is called um, top-down method because you are starting from the top from macroscopic or bulk material and uh, marching down. and here, this is called bottom up because you are starting from the lowest atomic scale and reaching the mesoscopic regime. And both of these regimes got its own advantages. Here, it is a low cost method. You can get, you can even get much lower dimension that you will realize once we discuss the top down fabrication methods. But the issue here is it's not really scalable. If you want to make an array of devices or a wafer full of devices with similar dimension or identical design, this method is not really suitable for that because these are kind of self-assembled structures. And uh, whereas top-down is highly controllable and precise and is scalable and that is what generally the semiconductor industry relies on. But the issue here is you cannot go beyond certain dimension 
that is basically decided by the resolution of the process that you are using to make this device. So here you have a table which which is size scale, okay, where and uh, how this process has been evolved over the years, okay. So now you can start from the top down. So you start from like few, you know, hundreds of micrometers and go down. That is how the device started, okay, or device technology started. And here it's a bottom up where you can use chemistry and various self assembly, you know, you know uh, self assembly methods and reach this regime. Whereas here you need, you can use precise and uh, microfabrication machining tools, lithography, and all the other technological gadgets to reach this regime. And finally, you are going to hit this regime, which is your mesoscopic regime. It's like a few tens of nanometers in size, this regime, okay? That's what you are going to you reach eventually, okay, here. Now, the essential tool, okay, to reach this length scale is the lithography. Okay, so that is the heart of microfabrication and all other process actually accompanies the lithography process. So lithography is probably the most important aspect of microfabrication tool without which you cannot have any microfabrication tool, microfabrication, okay. So lithography is the heart of top-down approach and that is going to be the main topic of discussion in this lecture. Here, the term lithography originates from an ancient printing process, okay. So what you have here is, you have some kind of a stone, okay, lithomin stone, okay, and you can draw whatever the pattern or whatever you want to print using a greasy substance, okay, whatever you can draw here that you draw with a greasy substance. And later on, what you do is, you moisten the stone with water, and the parts of the stone, not protected by the greasy paint, will get will absorb water, will get soaked with water, okay. But the ink that you are going to use is an oil-based ink. Once you roll that ink onto the stone, the ink will stick only to the greasy part, while the wet parts will not absorb the ink at all. And then what you can do is you can just press a paper onto it and wherever the ink is there, that will get transferred onto the paper. And you repeat this process. This is the, historically this is how the, the in ancient times printing had happened. And this process is the called lithography and the whole, this word lithography originated from this process. But part we, are going to discuss here is something slightly different. It's kind of a stencil painting where you have some kind of stencil and you apply paint or the stencil and that, that gets transferred onto the or onto the sub substrate or onto the or onto the uh, no, onto your hand here as shown. Okay. So this is the technique. This is the technique that we are going to discuss, but in a slightly different context where you use the stencil and everything are basically highly sophisticated gadgets which um, you use to create the pattern, okay. Now, here the lithography involves, in microfabrication the lithography involves use of energetic radiations or energetic ions or electrons, okay. So, it is the process is like you know taking a picture where you have some kind of a chemical which will undergo a chemical change when exposed to this radiation or ions or electron and that part wherever it was exposed you can specifically remove or selectively remove and you can get a stencil of the 
pattern which depends upon wherever you have you know exposed the radiation okay so for example there is a substrate here and you have a polymer which is which we call a resist okay which is coated on the substrate okay. and you have a stencil it's a black thick black line here which is placed on top of the substrate which is coated with this polymer and when you expose energetic radiation wherever the radiation goes through that is wherever you have openings for transparency on this mask all those the places under those region will get exposed to radiation and will undergo a chemical change okay now depending upon the type of the resist you can broadly classify this as a positive resist or a negative resist a positive resist is something which undergoes a chemical change when exposed to radiation and the chemical change is such that you can dissolve that region in some other solvent basically you have a long chain of polymer and whenever the radiation hits on the polymer the chain will break into smaller chains smaller pieces and you can easily dissolve that region in certain solvents okay so for example for a positive um, resist we call a positive torn resist this region wherever it get exposed to radiation will undergo chemical will, will get broken and you can dissolve and remove so you've got a stencil on top of the wafer on top of the substrate wherever the radiation has hit those those uh, places the resist has been removed okay now this process is called developing so you you coat the photoresist okay and you expose with the radiation then you develop then what you can do is you can basically create patterns by either by etching so wherever the resist is not there that place exposed for you to do further processing so either you can actually etch it down that means you can remove material and create a profile or alternatively you can also um, uh, deposit material metal or you know dielectric materials or other substrate other materials and you can create you can get layers of the material that you are going to deposit on this on this substrate okay and eventually you can remove or strip the polymer and you got a edge pattern here or if you have deposited you get a pattern metal on top of it or other whatever material you have deposited on top of it there are two you can do there are two processes either you can remove or you can add material onto substrate okay similarly the negative tone is just negative of this process so wherever the radiation has hit that will undergo a hardening process or that will undergo a polymerization process and you can remove the rest of the region using air solvent which is the develop which is the process of developing the resist then you will just get the negative of whatever your original mask was so this is your original mask and in this case you got a positive of this mask this is a positive or the same pattern that has been transferred onto the substrate in this case basically you get a negative or just inverse so it's opposite of whatever you had on the mask that is the pattern you got again similar process you can do whether you can add material or you can remove material further and eventually you can strip the resist and you will get the new pattern which is transferred onto the substrate that is the process so generally there are two things that you do either two things that you generally do that is either you photo after photolithography or after lithography you metallize it that means you deposit metal or you basically etch it or remove material so you have the wafer with the photoresist then after lithography you get a stencil you 
remove whatever the regions are exposed then you can add material that is represented by this red colored region here then you strip the places where you had resist on top of it and you will get this pattern or converse oppositely you can also do the same process but instead of uh, depositing you can remove the material and you will get the you will get you will get that profile onto the paper so so lithography essentially involves you create a stencil you create a pattern and then you can add material into the pattern or you can remove material using the pattern okay so that is essentially the process of process of lithography and uh, this lithography you can do either by energetic radiations such as ultraviolet radiation or x-ray radiation or you can also do with charged particles such as electrons and ions so both of these process we will discuss in this module so let us look at first the optical lithography in somewhat detail so so what you have is you have some kind of a you know, light source then there is something called a mask where which defines the pattern master pattern and there is some optical systems okay which defines or which will give you a parallel beam and you have photoresist coated substrate and the rest of the process but after lithography that is what we just uh, explained the previous slide so essentially this mask which are which are which contains the pattern is a glass or a quartz plate which has which is coated with some chromium and then that chromium has been patterned to whatever the desired shape which is which you are going to get get transferred onto the substrate okay now there are three modes that you can do the lithography one is called contact mode and second is a proximity mode it's almost in contact you can say soft contact this is a hard contact and there is a projection mode okay so in the contact mode whatever the substrate that you have that you hard press onto the mask and then expose to the radiation so in this case you will get a one-to-one -one magnification and uh, you can also get a resolution which is like a fraction of a micrometer the issue in this case is the contact can actually degrade the mask when you reuse it and you can also introduce particulates from the mask onto the substrate so this is kind of less cleaner process okay but you can get a much better resolution compared to the soft contact mode so it's a proximity mode where it's almost pressed onto the mask but you are inevitably going to have some gap between the mask and the substrate like a couple of micrometers okay in this case also you will get a one-to-one -one magnification but the resolution is limited to like a few couple of micrometer that is because of the diffraction effects which we will discuss very soon in the coming slide so you have this diffraction effects of this fine pattern that is going to reduce your resolution to like a couple of micrometer down to a couple of micrometer okay so this is what generally used in most of the research labs you see this is a process that you do in a mask aligner but of course your resolution is always limited by the diffraction limit okay and the third method is a projection method it's called projection lithography where you have mask then whatever the light beam coming out of the mask has been demagnified and focused down to the sample using a sophisticated optical system okay here you can actually get the resolution to few nanometers and this is what is used in microfabrication in the industry and there is no contact with the mask there is no mechanical align there is no hard pressing or soft pressing of the mask with the material so mask is relatively pristine and clean 
and you can have very high throughput during using this method but it's actually extremely expensive and uh, it's a complicated equipment and it's not really you know used in academic settings this is mostly up to the industry scale okay and recently there is this there is another method has come up which is called maskless lighter there is no mask at all what we have is you have something called a um, chip okay it is called dlp chip it's actually out of micro mirrors and this micro mirror you can control using a computer this is what is there in your dlp projector so whatever pattern you can feed into the computer this dlp chip can actually these mirrors can align and project that onto the substrate so what you have is you have a light source which is usually uv light source and all the associated optics with that then this has been you know guided to the micro mirror the micro mirror will actually project it onto a sample what are the pattern here that will get projected down to the sample and there are of, of course optical systems which used to demagnify this down to the sample so this is probably the best method in academic settings because it's relatively inexpensive you don't require a mask at all and you can create whatever pattern you can draw onto the computer you can create that you can on you can get that down to the substrate and this whole mask stage is being kind of removed and uh, and this process is also very clean because there is no direct contact with anything so you can just put the chip under it you can control the whole machine using computer we just feed whatever patterns you want and that will get projected it's a very fast process and very scalable and this also involves a lot of um, you know, mechanical movements because the working stage need to move to get a larger pattern okay but that is not a huge disadvantage because nowadays the systems come with extremely accurate stitching mechanisms down to few fraction of a micrometer to few tons of nanometer using laser interferometer controlled stages okay so these are the summary this is summary of all the various um, modes of the photo lithography okay process now a few examples so you have the uh, this is a workflow you have the plane wafer once you coat with the uh, resist you can get some discoloration is there some new color some interference pattern is there that is the interference from thin film uh, thin film of resist okay and um, then you can do lithography and define whatever patterns you need so the blue regions have are exposed okay and after that you can do a metallization stage where you deposit metal on top of it and remove the resist from the rest of the places so you get this pattern whatever you have drawn on the on the wafer okay instead of using these this is a conventional mask liner lithography okay instead of that you can use a maskless writer something like what we just explained and you can draw this wheel chariot wheel using this using the computer you can just take a pattern from internet or from whatever the you know the the cat file you have and you can project that onto the substrate and you can get that developed this is like 400 micrometer is the size here so the whole that is the the center of the chariot wheel is like a, you know 200 micrometer okay now what do you have here is after you develop you deposit metal on top of it that the portion process also we will uh, you know, outline in towards the end of uh, this lecture and uh, of course then you strip the resist on the rest of the places then you go to this wheel transferred onto, onto the wafer similarly this is example where the emblem of the isotherm has been drawn using this projection lithography system so now we have gone through the basic 
lithography process for creating patterns down to few micrometer. For example, here these thin lines like a couple of micrometers in width, and here the center of the chariot wheel is like a, you know 200 micrometer, and uh, these arms are like it like a few micrometer wide in length okay and this photolithography involves a light and when you use light you are bound to have diffraction effects so there are two kinds of diffraction effects that affects the resolution of lithography especially photolithography one is the near field diffraction which affects the hard contact mode or soft contact mode lithography and then you have the far field diffraction that affects the projection lithography or the resolution of the projection lithography so when the pattern or the mask is in contact the substrate you will you're expecting that the whole pattern will complete it projected onto the or exposed onto the substrate accurately for example if you have a pattern which is like a rectangular region okay and ideally when the distance between the mask and substrate is zero you are expecting that the light will fall uniformly in this region okay on the substrate but what we have is something called near field diffraction pattern on on this on the on the substrate even though this is the width what we have on the mask but the near field diffraction because you are inevitably you will have some really small gap okay between the mask and the substrate in the soft contact mode even though you are pressing it against it but you still have like a very small gap which which actually can come from the non uniformity of the thickness of the photoresist or some small angle whatever is reason and you are also not in the hard contact mode anyway okay so you are going to have this small gap okay so what you will get on the substrate is a pattern which looks like this okay and that will get deformed as you increase the distance so this is for 2 micrometer and when you go to 4 micrometer you will get this 6 micrometer you will get this so you can see that the pattern is going to spread okay further and further and now you are getting much further the, the intensity is spreading much further into the region where you don't want the light at the, at the expense of intensity reduced where you want it uniformly okay so close to like 14 15 micrometer this is what you are going to get where this is what you wanted okay so the resolution is severely limited by this near field diffraction okay and the minimum resolution is given by this formula where k is a parameter depending upon the uh, photoresist and other details which you can take as one it is close to one lambda is the wavelength and g is the gap so when the gap is 0.6 micrometer sorry when the gap is 1 micrometer your your resolution is something like 0.6 and as you increase the gap the resolution is also going to reduce and eventually it hits like a couple of micrometer or more when you have like 20 micrometer gap between the mask and the between the mask and the substrate so in the 
soft contact mode or proximity mode, your resolution is severely affected by the near field diffraction. And the best you can get, as I discussed in the, the previous slide, is like a couple of micrometers. It is not limited by the completely by the wavelength, it is actually limited by the uh, near, near field diffraction effects. Okay. Now let's look at what happened in the far field case. In the far field case, what we have is the, the abyss limit, which is basically the Rayleigh's criteria and the effect of a refracting resource are built into it. Okay, that is abyss limit. Okay, so here the magnitude or the um, resolution is of the same order as the wavelength. You can do slightly better than your near field one. Okay. It is decided by the uh, diffraction effect, far field diffraction effect. And the minimum dimension is given by this formula, where k1 is like a less than 1, usually 0.5 to 0.75. Lambda is the wavelength, n is numerical aperture. So you can basically engineer or play with the numerical aperture by using mediums with them. Um, higher refracting index to reduce the limit, okay, but reduce the or make the pattern finer. So what you are, what you wanted is something like this, but what you are going to get is something like this, okay, because of the diffraction. And it is not only that it's going to spread the pattern, it also will have non-uniform intensity and your, the, how the pattern is developed also will depend on the VGM. Okay, for example, the center part will get more dose, whereas the edges will get less dose. Okay, so the dose itself is non uniform around. In all this diffraction, because of all these diffraction effects, dose itself, the amount of light which is falling on is going to be completely non uniform, and that also will affect your affect the quality of the pattern, not only the resolution. Okay, so this is the effect of far field diffraction. Okay, in neither case your resolution is compromised severely by the diffraction effects. And there is another um, limitation that comes from the depth of focus, okay, especially for the projection lithography. If you have like regions on the sample with various heights, okay, for example, you have some edge profile on the sample and you want to draw some patterns onto it. So you have regions with different heights on the sample, okay. So depth of focus is given by this formula, where it is completely focused in here, okay? This is over focused here and under focused here, okay? So this depth of focus sigma is also depending upon the wavelength and also numerical aperture. Now here, depth of focus is more when you have larger wavelength, okay. So you assume that you can play with a slightly larger wavelength and uh, get a larger depth of focus. But now that will be under the expense of this resolution here, okay? Because this criteria says the resolution is also limited by the wavelength. So if you try to increase the depth of focus, make the depth of focus better by increasing the wavelength, that is will be under the expense of this resolution here. Okay, so you can actually increase the depth of focus and also the resolution by playing with the numerical aperture by using medium which has a higher uh, index of refraction, okay, just by, to reduce the numerical aperture. That is what generally is done, okay. So wavelength you cannot touch very much because the wavelength is mostly fixed by the characteristic of the resistive because the certain resistors are basically sensitive to certain wavelength region. Okay, so the wavelength is kind of fixed mostly into the UV region, UV regime. 
okay now what you have is the the numerical aperture for the optical system that is what you are going to adjust or engineer to get a better resolution in both the vertical and also the lateral uh, direction okay